This is the day that the Lord has made, and we should always rejoice and be glad in it. And we give God thanks and praise, honor and glory for what he has done for us, he's doing right now, but especially what he's about to do. It's a new season, and we are grateful and a privilege for God bringing us thus far, and yet further to take us. Now, this teachings we're going to discuss the Gospel of Mark, Part 1. And I pray as we go into the teachings that you'll be blessed with it. It enrich your life and your family's life and be receptive and open to receive. And be reminded of what His Word has said, saying right now, and will forever say, so that we are blessed vessels used for His glory. The Gospel of Mark. We begin our series on exploring the books of the New Testament with the Gospels. The Gospels of Matthew, Mark and Luke are referred to as the Synoptic Gospels because they include many of the same stories, often in a similar sequence and in similar or sometimes identical wording. They stand in contrast to the Gospel of John, whose content is largely distinct. The term Synoptic comes via Latin from the Greek synopsis, that is, seeing all together, a synopsis, the sense of the word in English, the one specifically applied to all these three Gospels, of giving an account of the events from the same point of view or under the same general aspect, is a modern one. This strong parallelism among the three Gospels in content, arrangement and specific language is widely attributed to literary interdependence. The question of the precise nature of the literary relationship, the synoptic problem, has been a topic of lively debate for centuries. The long-standing majority view favours Mark and priority, in which both Matthew and Luke have made direct use of the Gospel of Mark as a source, and further holds that Matthew and Luke also drew from additional sources. On the basis of this priority, we will begin with exploring the Book of Mark. The Gospel of Mark is the most concise account of the beginning of the Gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. The author is not identified in the Gospel, which is the case for all the Gospels, but the early and unanimous testimony of the Church was that John Mark was the author. Papias, an early church father whose work dates around 95 to 110 AD, provides the earliest extant account of who wrote the Gospels. Eusebius preserves a verbatim excerpt from Papias on the origin of Mark. And Mark Papias cites John the Elder. The Elder used to say, Mark, in his capacity as Peter's interpreter, wrote down accurately as many things as he recalled from memory though not in an ordered way, of the things either said or done by the Lord. For he neither heard the Lord nor accompanied him. But later, as I said, Peter, who used to give his teachings in the form of useful anecdotes, but had no intention of providing an ordered arrangement of the Logian of the Lord. Consequently, Mark did nothing wrong when he wrote down some individual items just as he related them from memory. For he made it one concern not to omit anything he had heard or to falsify anything. Although the date of writing the Gospel is uncertain, it is usually placed in the range of the late 50s to the mid 60s AD. The Gospel was written to a non-Jewish audience, usually accepted as being written in Rome, designed for Roman believers. Hence, there is no focus on genealogies and beginnings in the Gospel but instead the Roman style of emphasis on actions. The writer uses the Greek word for immediately 42 times in the 16 chapters. The book's aim was to inspire Roman believers through the life, suffering, death and resurrection of Jesus to persevere through the upcoming persecution they were facing. In this book of action, Mark includes over half of Christ's 35 recorded miracles, but only 18 out of the 70 known parables. The Gospel can be split into five sections. 1. The presentation of the servant, from chapters 1 through 2.12. 2. The opposition to the servant, chapter 2, verse 13 to chapter 8, verse 26. 3. Instruction by the servant, from chapter 8.27 to chapter 10.52. 4. Three, rejection of the servant, chapter 11.1 1 to 15.47. And the last section, number 5, resurrection of the servant, from 16, verse 1 through 16, verse 20. Sections 1 and 2 cover about three years. Section 3, about 6 months, and Sections 4 and 5, 8 days. Mark chapter 1 through 7.23, set in Galilee. Chapters 7.24 to 9.29 is set among the pagans, and chapters 9.30 to 10.52 is on the road to Jerusalem, and chapter 11 forward is in Jerusalem. 
In the first two sections, Jesus is establishing and demonstrating his authority. In part one, we will cover chapters one to eight, and in part two, chapters nine to sixteen. Mark opens his gospel quickly with the introduction of John the Baptist, Jesus' baptism, and the temptation in the wilderness. Mark chapter one verse two reads, "As it's written in Isaiah the prophet, I will send my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way. A voice of one calling in the wilderness: Prepare the way for the Lord, make straight path for him." And so John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And this was his message: After me comes the one more powerful than I, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. At that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. Just as Jesus was coming out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove, and a voice came from heaven. You are my son, whom I love. With you, I am well pleased. Uh, once the Spirit sent him out into the wilderness, and he was in the wilderness for forty days, being tempted by Satan. He was with the wild animals, and angels attended him. After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. When he got a little farther, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John in a boat preparing their nets. Without delay, he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. They went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, Jesus went into the synagogue and began to teach. The people were amazed at his teaching because he taught them as one who had authority, not as teachers of the law. In verses twenty-three to twenty-six, Jesus heals a possessed man in the synagogue, and then Peter's mother-in-law. And in verse thirty-two, we read that evening after sunset, the people brought to Jesus all who were ill and demon-possessed. The whole town gathered at the door, and Jesus healed many who had various diseases. He also drove out many demons, but he would not let the demons speak because they knew who he was. Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went up to a solitary place where he prayed. Simon and his companions went to look for him, and when they found him, they exclaimed, "Everyone is looking for you!" Jesus replied, "Let us go somewhere else to the nearby villages, so that I can preach there also. That is why I have come." So he travelled throughout Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and driving out demons. A man with leprosy came to him and begged him on his knees, "If you are willing, you can make me clean." Jesus was indignant. He reached out his hand and touched the man. "I am willing," he said. "Be clean." Immediately the leprosy left him and he was cleansed. Instead, he went out and began to talk freely, spreading the news. As a result, Jesus could no longer enter a town openly, but stayed outside in lonely places. Yet the people still came to him from everywhere. In chapter two through three, verse six, we encounter the first conflict with the Pharisees. A few days later, when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come. They gathered in such large numbers that there was no room left, not even outside the door. And he preached the word to them. Some men came, bringing him to him a paralyzed man carried by four of them. Since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus by digging through it and then lowered the mat the man was lying on. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, "Son, your sins are forgiven." Now, some teachers of the law were sitting there, thinking to themselves, "Why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone?" Immediately, Jesus knew in his spirit that this was what they were thinking in their hearts, and he said to them, "Why are you thinking these things? Which is easier to say to this paralyzed man, 'Your sins are forgiven,' or to say, 'Get up.'" Take your mat and walk. But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the man, "I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home." He got up, took his mat, and walked out in full view of them all. This amazed everyone, and they praised God, saying, "We've never seen anything like this." In chapter two, verse fourteen, Jesus calls Levi, a tax collector, as a disciple. He then eats at Levi's house with many tax. Tax collectors and sinners. When the teachers of the law, who were Pharisees, saw him eating with the sinners and tax collectors, they asked his disciples, "Why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners?" On hearing this, Jesus said to them, 
It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. The Pharisees then criticized Jesus for not instructing his disciples to fast when others were fasting, and for doing what they considered work on the Sabbath. Faced with the latter criticism, Jesus said to them, The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. After healing a man with a shriveled hand in the synagogue on a Sabbath day, then the Pharisees went out and began to plot with the Herodians how they might kill Jesus. Jesus is attracting people from a wide area as the people hear of his miracles. As a result, he has to seclude himself. In chapter 3, verse 18, we read, Jesus went up on a mountainside and called to him those he wanted, and they came to him. He appointed twelve that they might be with him, and that he might send them out to preach, and to have authority to drive out demons. These are the twelve he appointed. Simon, to whom he gave the name Peter, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, to them he gave the name Bonages, which means sons of thunder, Andrew, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, son of Alphaeus, Thaddeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. When Jesus entered a house, and again a crowd gathered, so that he and his disciples were not even able to eat. When his family heard about this, they went to take charge of him, for they said he's out of his mind. And the teachers of the law who came down from Jerusalem said, he's possessed by Beelzebub. By the prince of demons is driving out demons. So Jesus called them over to him and began to speak to them in parables. How can Satan drive out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. If a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. And if Satan opposes himself and is divided, he cannot stand. His end has come. In fact, no one can enter a strong man's house without first tying him up. Then he can plunder the strong man's house. Truly I tell you, people can be forgiven all their sins and every slander they utter. But whoever blasphemous against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven. They are guilty of an eternal sin. He said this because they were saying he has an impure spirit. When Jesus' mother and brothers arrived, standing outside they sent someone in to call him. A crowd was sitting around him. They told him, Your mother and brothers are outside looking for you. Who are my mother and my brothers? He asked. Then he looked at those seated in the circle around him and said, Here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does God's will is my brother and sister and mother. Chapter 4 lists four of Jesus' teachings before going on to another miracle demonstrating his authority. The teachings on the kingdom of God are the parable of the sower, a lamp on a stand, the parable of the growing seed, and the parable of the mustard seed. That day when evening came, he said to his disciples, Let us go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along, just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with him. A furious squall came up, and the waves broke over the boat, so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? He got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, Quiet, be still. Then the wind died down, and it was completely calm. He said to his disciples, Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified and asked each other, Who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. In chapter 5, Jesus and the apostles cross over the lake to Gerasenes, a town in the Hellenistic Decapolis region. When confronted by a demon-possessed man, Jesus commands the demons to leave the man. The demons ask to be sent into a herd of pigs, which Jesus does. The pigs then rush into the lake and are drowned. The people, seeing the man healed and the pigs dead, ask Jesus to leave. The healed man wants to leave with Jesus, but Jesus did not let him, but said, Go home to your own people and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. So the man went away and began to tell in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him. And all the people were amazed. Jesus crosses back over the lake to be met by Jairus, the synagogue ruler. He begs Jesus to heal his dying daughter. As they're on the way, Jesus heals a woman who's had an issue of blood for 12 years before messengers come in telling Jairus his daughter is dead. Taking only Peter, James and John, Jesus goes to Jairus' home. He went in and said to them, Why all this commotion and wailing? The child is not dead, but asleep. But they laughed at him. After he put them all out, he took the child's father and mother and the disciples who were with him and went to him where the child was. He took her by the hand and said to her, Talitha Kowum, which means, Little girl, I say to you, get up. 
Immediately the girl stood up and began to walk around. She was twelve years old. At this they were completely astonished. The only story of chapter 6 is an indicator of the early writing of Mark's Gospel, as he questions the faith of his family who were going to be involved in the early church leadership. Chapter 6 opens, Jesus left there and went to his hometown, accompanied by his disciples. When the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were amazed. Where did this man get these things, they asked? What's this wisdom that's been given him? What are these remarkable miracles he's performing? Isn't this the carpenter? Isn't this Mary's son and the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon? Aren't his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor, except in his own town, among his relatives, and in his own home. He could not do any miracles there except lay his hands on a few sick people and heal them. He was amazed at their lack of faith. Jesus then sends out the apostles two by two with authority over evil spirits. Mark starts to build his gospel towards the declaration of Jesus as Messiah in chapter 8, verse 26, by recounting the events of John the Baptist's death as to why Herod would believe Jesus was John the Baptist come back from the dead. Chapter 6, verse 15, we read, Others said he's Elijah, and still others claimed he's a prophet like one of the prophets of long ago. But when Herod heard this, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised from the dead. Herodias' daughter had asked for the head of the Baptist after she'd danced for Herod's birthday banquet. Mark follows up with two miracle stories, the feeding of the 5,000 and Jesus walking on the water. But when they saw him walking on the lake, they thought he was a ghost. They cried out, because they all saw him and were terrified. Immediately he spoke to them and said, Take courage. It is I. Don't be afraid. Then he climbed into the boat with them, and the wind died down. They were completely amazed, for they had not understood about the loaves. Their hearts were hardened. When they had crossed over, they landed at Gennesaret and anchored there. As soon as they got out of the boat, people recognized Jesus. They ran throughout that whole region and carried the sick on mats to wherever they heard he was. And wherever he went, into villages, towns, or countryside, they placed the sick in the marketplaces. They begged him to let them touch even the edge of his cloak, and all who touched it were healed. Chapter 7 opens with the Pharisees again trying to find fault with Jesus. So the Pharisees and teachers of the law asked Jesus, Why don't your disciples live according to the tradition of the elders, instead of eating their food with defiled hands? And he, Jesus, continued, You have a fine way of setting aside the commands of God in order to observe your own traditions. Thus, you nullify the word of God by your own tradition that you have handed down. And you do many things like that. Again, Jesus called the crowd to him and said, Listen to me. Everyone and understand this. Nothing outside a person can defile them by going into them. Rather, it is what comes out of a person that defiles them. He went on. What comes out of a person is what defiles them. For it is from within, out of a person's heart, that evil thoughts come. Sexual immorality, theft, murder, Adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, and folly. All these evils come from inside and defile a person. Chapter 7 closes with the Greek woman begging Jesus to heal her daughter, saying that even dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs, and getting the response of such a reply, her daughter's healed. Jesus then heals a deaf mute in the Decapolis, before repeating the miraculous feeding of a crowd. This time about 4,000 men, with the disciples collecting seven baskets of bread after everyone had eaten. The Pharisees ask for a sign from Jesus, but he refuses. Jesus then heals a blind man in Bethsaida and then sends him home, continuing his trend of telling people in Jewish areas to keep quiet, while telling those in non-Jewish areas to tell people what he has done. In chapter 8, Jesus and his disciples go on to the villages around Caesarea Philippi. On the way, he asks them, Who do people say I am? They replied, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, but and still others, one of the prophets. But what about you? He asked. Who do you say I am? Peter answered, You are the Messiah. Jesus warned him not to tell anyone about him. He then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. 
Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, Whoever wants to be my disciples must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. But whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save him. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world and yet forfeit it? their soul or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul if anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation the son of man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his father's glory with the holy angels so part one of our gospel of mark ends with a question we must also answer who do we say jesus is our eternal destiny depends on the answer that we give. Is he Lord, liar, or lunatic? Jesus claimed to be God, but people have claimed that he teached with authority and they could find no fault in him. So if he's not a liar or lunatic, there's only one possible answer. He is Lord. And to accept him as Lord of your life and pray this prayer with us now, should we pray? Dear God in heaven, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I acknowledge to you that I'm a sinner and I'm sorry for my sins and the life that I've lived. I need your forgiveness. I believe that your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, shed his precious blood on the cross at Calvary and died for my sins. And I am now willing to turn from my sin. You said in the Bible that if we confess the Lord our God and believe in our hearts that God raised Jesus from the dead, we shall be saved. Right now I confess Jesus as my Lord. With my heart I believe God raised Jesus from the dead. This very moment I accept Jesus Christ as my own personal Saviour. And according to his word right now, I am saved. Amen. Amen. So we just thank you for praying that prayer. And uh, the next step that you need to do, if you just prayed that prayer for the first time, is both to uh, seek the presence of God through prayer and through reading the Word of God, the Bible, and also find yourself a good church that you can uh, join and uh, share fellowship with the saints. The Bible tells us as well that we shouldn't forego coming together in congregation to praise and worship God and to strengthen ourselves. May you be blessed. An important point in the first part of the book of Mark, and of course not forgetting that we have completed the books of the Old Testament, but in order for us to go forth in the New Testament, there had to be an Old Testament. We give God thanks for that, for his word also. But in the book of Mark, what stands out mostly is we have here the, the life of Christ and the faithfulness of God that Jesus came uh, one reason for we to be reconciled back to him. The choosing of Jesus' disciples, and uh, even in Jesus' ministry, there's a notification of the Pharisees in those days, we call them the high priests. But today, we call them bishops, apostles, the, the ones that have been positioned in strategic places in the body of Christ. And yet, have an encounter with Jesus because they were so used to and familiar with a programmed way of teaching God's people, but an encounter with the truth, which in Jesus is the truth and the life, it brought them to a crossroad in their life that what they have been teaching is not what God intended for them to teach because it, they had their own agenda in which in, they made it such a way that they made the rules and if you're not ab abiding by it, you're either being criticized or condemned. But yet Jesus looked beyond the faults of whatever man had done and he forgave the sins. And we have learned and heard how no matter what sin has been committed, God is the only one who forgives sins. But yet Jesus himself, he clarified that with the Pharisees. One command is to do the will of God. And today... God is saying for us, he's saying to us, there's only one season, there's only one reason that created is for us to direct the people back to him and to glorify his name. So let us remain faithful in what God has called us to do and that's to do his will. And it's conclusion of the first part of Ma, and I pray that even so that you will be blessed and enriched to go forth in God's strength and be blessed with the teachings.